Welcome to Around the ACL. It's Michelle Thompson here with Anthony Ione and Trey Ryder. And we have a great show for you today because we're going to talk about the Open coming up. It's been a minute since we got to talk about an Open. So excited to dive into that. We'll talk about some news around the league. We'll give some grades for the National West. We've got Buy or Sell and, of course, Trey's favorite game, Name That Team. Trey, you played some cornhole this weekend. And you didn't totally embarrass yourself. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't totally embarrass myself. It was good. Um, I didn't play like really that well, but like it, it was one of those things where I wasn't too upset by it because I made some pretty difficult shots, and there was just I missed too many bags like sliding like mm. left and right, and I was like, you know what? I feel like this is kind of just like a consistency thing. Um, like I had a couple big air mails. I had one game. I think I threw four air mails and I hit three of them or something like that. And I threw, wow. I played, it was moderately sticky and I threw sticky bags and there was a block. There were bags in front of the hole every single round that I played. So I felt like I controlled it. The issue, the only issue I ran into was like, there were some instances where like I'd go to clean up the block and I'd have a good shot. And then like, wide open slide shot for three points or two <laughs> points. And I just push it left. It's like I had too many, I had too many rounds in which I missed too many bags to the left of the hole, which created bumpers. And that was, that was the issue. So like I had a couple good slide around bags. I had a couple good air mails, a couple good pushes, but I just now, need to get better at sliding bags in the hole. Now, if I think it was your tweet, you said it's been two years, right? Was it so I actually looked back. So after I tweeted that, I actually said, you know what? I need to look. And I looked at the phone number that I received, you know, because you'll get a text from an ACL, yeah. you know, number. And I had subbed in one game in November of 2021. I subbed <laughs> in a game for somebody in an HQ blind draw because I happened to be here and then he needed somebody. And then before that, it was like beginning. It was like early ish. 2021 yeah. so it was about two years and about two years crazy yeah not bad so it not was bad and i was nervous yeah <laughs> i was nervous <laughs> like I, there's no reason for me to be nervous and i was absolutely like oh gosh like i'm playing playing so like it's a different it's a different beast it's a different beast when when you play just kind of a pickup mm -hmm. game then you go into like a singles tournament that you know counts so but isn't that isn't that dope, man? I mean, that nervousness that you felt. Like, when was the last time you felt that kind of like, you know, competitive nerve? I, probably two years. In a while, right? I, <laughs> yeah, see, I think I love that feeling, man. I I don't get that from very many things. Um, the competitive nerve, uh, you know, that just like the competition burn in your stomach. I, I love it. That's yeah. what gets me coming back. That's what gets me. Coming I back. kind of. I get a version of that when we go to do an event sometimes, right? Cause it's not, it's almost like I'm excited. I'm anxious. I'm ready to go. I want to get this going. I want to execute that kind of thing. It's not exactly the same. I, I don't get it when I commentate commentate. I don't get like nervous like that. I just, I mean, I've done it so many times now. It's just like, it's just doing it, yep. but like getting prepared for a full event. Like when you go into a national, I get a little bit of a flavor of it, but it was, uh, no, it was good. I agree, Anthony. I love that feeling, and I don't get that from a lot of things. And sideline reporting was the first time I felt that for, like, long time. Long time? Long time. I was like, oh, there it is. <laughs> I remember that feeling. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you did sideline for the first time for us, did you expect to be that nervous, or did it hit you like, oh, wait, I'm actually nervous? Um, no, I think it was like in, in line with my expectations because my nerves wasn't, was had nothing to do with the cameras, the mic, none of that. It had to do with feeling unprepared, like just feeling like I don't, I don't yeah. know these players very well. I don't know. I don't have enough questions logged in my brain. Like I'm being thrown in situations I've never done before, but it had nothing to do with the actual camera stuff at all. But it was like not feeling prepared. I don't like that. I don't yeah. like to not feel prepared. So it was like, oh my God, what if I just run out of things to say and I'm live? Yeah. Like <laughs> that's gonna be really Michelle, bad. Michelle Michelle doesn't like to be 
unprepared, but she signs up to do around the ACL with me when I run the run of show. And <laughs> Surprise! No, but this is yeah. what we're talking about today. You got three minutes. So I feel like I have enough baseline knowledge, right? Like it, I don't, I don't. There are things that you need to prepare for in life because you're like, I don't have enough baseline knowledge for this yet to just wing it. And there are things you don't. And when the college tournament, I didn't have enough baseline knowledge. I didn't have enough sideline reporting experience to have just questions banked in my head. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I can wing things that I have some kind of footing in, but that was not it. So yeah, there you go. All right, let's go into open number seven. It's going to be in New Mexico. Uh, we were just saying before this, we got a big turnout for this event. So, uh, and a lot of names, like a lot of amateur names on that list. So very curious to see how this runs. It would not surprise me to see maybe a pro not take it with that amount of people coming, but we shall see. Um, Anthony, who do you think are some uh, people we should be watching out for, for uh, this upcoming weekend? Yeah, so like you were saying, you know, a, a bigger event than than I was expecting uh, out of New Mexico. Um, we're kind of looking at this one a bit live. I, I was able to go through and just highlight some names real quick, but I think it'd be good to kind of just give everyone a big picture. Um, not in the field. I, I was able to kind of scan through real quick and pick out a few names. Noted not in the field. You got an Alex Rawls, you know, top 10 or top 15 type of talent. No Alex Rawls, no Matt Guy. No Jamie Graham, Devin Harbaugh, Mark Richards, Tony Smith, Hollins, a Wooten, and Almanza or Birchfield. These are the type of players not in the field for this open number seven, but it's really stacked with a lot of these uh, kind of this younger, I, I kind of feel like overall just kind of looking at it now, that younger generation, a lot of talent with your Hamiltons, your Conos, your JBJs. You know, uh, your Alec Ryan, your Weedenfield, um, you know, these are the type of guys that you're going to see in the field, but kind of just going down single so everyone can get a sense. That's what the juniors in the field. I mentioned Burton Jr. Interested in what we're going to get out of Cameron Kingfisher. I think he's teaming up with Is Isabella this season. I've caught a few of his matches. I was pretty impressed at what he could do. He's definitely going to bring that same carpet, sturdy out, uh, dirty style game that Isabella is going to give us. Um, I think he could be maybe a top 50 player. So I'm excited to see what he, he does. The reigning champ, we mentioned Hamilton, Kano. We've got a Sammy Soda in this one. Um, probably one of the best amateurs out there um, alongside maybe a Caden Allen. This is a kid that could come out and maybe win the whole thing. Wouldn't surprise me if he did. Maybe not on the map nationally, but certainly in that region of, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, just kind of that area over there. This kid can ball. Uh, Tanner Halbert, Camba. I was surprised to actually see Halbert on this list. Um, the guy just doesn't get out much, you know, with the kids, with the job. I can see Camba kind of being the one going, hey, let's go to let's go to this open. You know, what do you think? And, and Halbert being like, all right, well, let me see what I can work out. But those guys are going to be in your field. Probably one of the more veteran ones I'm just kind of seeing in the field. I see a modeling. I see a Windsor. So they're going to bring a lot of high-value talent. Hubenheim coming out from Florida along with Frazier, Batson, Ryan Smith in the field. I see Fillingham here talking to her a little bit in Myrtle beach. I think she's set up to have a much improved season this year and watching her play. Uh, her numbers definitely show the same. Wouldn't be surprised if we see a Fillingham in the top six, maybe in women. So excited to see how she uh, comes out. Philip Lopez is coming out, even though Richards is not, uh, I mentioned Caden Allen, a guy who I think he's won every single bracket this season and opens that he has been at. We'll see if he continues that. Grindersleeve's going to be nice. Ricky G kind of in that area. Um, Zaft is in, but Hadley is not. That was interesting. Um, Bob Vonch, Getty can be nice. Ty Lopez, Voyer coming out of Cali. Um, again, I think another one of those players that could be improved this season. So looking to see what he could do at this open number seven. You're going to have both Foreman and Creek Killer. Turpin making it out. Nico Morellas coming out with a different partner. We can talk about that a little bit when we get into doubles, though. Nate Stevens, Alex Hicks. Where, where is Alex Hicks at this season? Um, you know, he won three open singles last season. Nothing really much yet here for the 2023 season and on a lot of our top 10 lists. So where's Alex Hicks and what do we get from Alex Hicks? So really interested to see if he can make a run here at open number seven. Um, Borja Finley, Felix Vargas. Uh, also on my watch list. I got to see him in, in, in Myrtle Beach. I think he might surprise us. I wouldn't be surprised if this guy came out and was a top 30 guy, someone that wasn't on anybody's radar. Mike Ferreira, 
Danny Seals and Yeti Irwan. And then to kind of wrap up my, my list in singles, uh, Caleb Franklin. Um, and I already mentioned Kingfisher. That kind of wraps up what I was kind of keeping an eye on for singles. What, what do you think, Trey? <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm going to do singles and doubles at the same time. We'll go back to you for doubles. So cool. I'm going to just cheat. Um, yeah, I think – That's cool, guys. You uh, just go ahead and do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, let's hear, your, let's hear no, your top no, singles and doubles go, to watch. You go. You go, Trey. You run, you run the show however you want. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I, I agree. I agree. There's a lot of names on this list that I don't know which means it feels like one of those opens that kind of, you know, an amateur comes through and takes down. Um, that's just generally how these usually play out, right, is is because, you know, some of the pros may end up running into each other, and it is what it is. Um, I got a Caleb Batson sticking out to me as someone who, who really finished the open season strong at the end of the year. Um last season and i'm looking for him to kind of have one of those breakout performances trey Giant, that, yeah i was just going to say that that last i think it was open 16 that batson won it was right towards the end could have been the last one i have not seen batson better than he was Correct. in that open i don't think anyone was going to beat him that day that is the batson he was my favorite player his rookie season to watch the entire season and I just don't feel like the same bat. I don't know what happened, but if that same bats and that we saw at open 16, 15, whatever it was comes out this weekend, I agree. He could win the whole thing, but that's the bats. And I look forward to see play a hundred percent, hundred percent. I was, I was really excited to see him play um, in particular, Caden Allen, you know, someone that we're going to see again, you know, that'll be, he'll be a, a pro next season. Um, you know, it, he's just someone that's, that's got all the talent in the world to be, could even be a top five player. I mean, he's really that good. Yeah. Um, yes. I think top fifteen at worst. He is the upside of a top five player. Um, that's just how how good I think he is. I really like on doubles the Cheyenne Bubenheim Jeremy Frazier partnership. Yeah. I think that one is going to give a little bit of. Um, I think it's just going to be interesting, right? Because I think that the more I think about it, that chemistry kind of aligns a little bit, right? And I think it's something that. Um, just because if, if people remember Bubenheim and Frazier were both on the woodchucks last year. And so they kind of developed a little bit of team chemistry. I believe Frazier may be on that team again this year. And so I, I think it's an opportunity for, you know, them to, to play kind of be a sneaky team that nobody's really thinking about, but one that I, I think has a chance to make a really deep run. Um, uh, going kind of going through my list, um, Matthew Creek killer and Jacob Foreman, um, I felt like have almost in a way been forgotten about by some people, right? It's like, Oh wait, these guys are really good. They were a top 10 team last year. They were really dominant. They made a broadcast. Like they're still really good, <laughs> right? There's, yeah. there's, there's a reason that, um, that, you know, they were, they were talked about so much last year. Uh, you talked a little bit about Jordan Camba and Tanner Halbert. I think that one's going to be an interesting doubles pairing. Um, I, I think it's, I think they were very close, maybe not very close, but I think there was a chance at least in the off season that Canva and Halbert would have ended up being doubles partners for this season. So yep. seeing them again at an open and see how they perform may give us a little invitation. Is that something in the future that these two think about? Is that something that's, you know, maybe in line? I, I, I don't know. Right. It's just something, something that came across my mind. Gavin Cano and Fisher Hamilton, a team that um, won an open last year. We've been talking about Gavin Cano. We know what Fisher Hamilton can do. Can they kind of put it all together? You know, the one thing that's interesting is now is that th this team isn't one that can go under the radar anymore. This is a team that has to be looked at with, you know, superstar level potential. And does that, add a little bit additional pressure to, to prevent them from playing loose like they did last season. And the last one I think that's worth talking about for me real quick is just uh, Sammy Soto and Justin Burton Jr., um, a, a duo out of Texas. There's a lot of talk from Texas about Sammy Soto. Um, uh, uh, Logan Chamberman point blank says Sammy Soto is the best player in the state of Texas. And is that he, says yeah. a lot. Uh, yes. So he was, he's, he was under 16 this past yep. year, 
which is how he didn't end up getting uh, a pro spot going into this season. And, you know, maybe not him personally, but the people around him kind of took that personally. Like, they don't like the fact that Sammy Soto was not not a pro coming into this season. Um, it's just, just not. So, um, it's just interesting, um, you know, to see how, how he plays now in this Open. Obviously, him and I believe – Grant Upchurch won advanced doubles world championship this past year. So he's got the skill to compete. Um, I'm just really excited to see him and, and Justin Burton Jr. kind of put it together. Justin Burton Jr. first round pick. Um, apparently him and Soto have some great showdowns in Texas. So we'll see if they can put it all together. You got anything to add to doubles, Anthony, before we move on? Yeah, I'm just going to scan through, see if I can find some ones you didn't mention. Um, yeah, actually going to the the Frazier Bubenheim matchup. The one first thing that came to my mind, and we're thinking that Jeremy Frazier is going to be a breakout player this year, right? His lady is Courtney Coy. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So they're they're together. Uh, I, I, I don't know, man. If if my lady was as good as Courtney Coy and loved cornhole like she, I better be a top twenty player. Like I would be gangster on the board if my lady. <laughs> was as good as Courtney Coy. So yeah, I agree. Uh, that one will be interesting. Um, just kind of going through the rest of them here. I saw Bob Bunch and Ian Cripps on the list. I mean, you talk about just from the demographic standpoint, uh, I think Bob Bunch is maybe upper fifties. And then you got Ian Cripps. I think he's the youngest player in the league, if I remember correctly. So that's well, what's cool about maybe Cornhole. Third. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I love that one there. Uh, Ryan and Soprenit looks fun. Um, obviously, Soprenit needs to hold her side down if they're going to make a decent run, which she can, uh, which she can. I saw Nate Stevens and Nico Morellas on here. That's an interesting one. Nate Stevens, again, one of the most underrated or, you know, just overlooked players, I think, in the league. And then Nico Morellas just had that weird season where he was a top guy in all categories. So, Hey, that would be fun if those guys came out, both of them, and said, hey, here we are. I know you guys overlook us both, but as a partnership, watch us doing work. Again, I go back to Alex Hicks, and this time he's with Windsor. I know Windsor's been moving around a little bit with partners, but we're going to get Windsor and Hicks here at Open 7. Win it. Why, why wouldn't they win it? I mean, they're in my top 10 as a doubles team. They're top 10 individually, so... Windsor and Hicks win this thing. I mean, why not? Um, kind of finishing it up here. The last one uh, I mentioned, Ferreira and Shibner. So Shibner kind of came on my radar in Myrtle Beach. Um, you know, I think out of the draft, that was one of the one of the the best lines. I think that was just accidental. You know, Shibner don't don't like it. Kind I don't of thing, like but- it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like it. Um, <laughs> but what's awesome is he could literally you know, shut me up completely because he he's he's showing that he is that talented. Um, he's showing that, you know, maybe that pick wasn't as crazy as it sounds. So him and Ferreira, Ferreira also making a comeback, uh, finishing school with his master's degree, focusing on cornhole quite a bit. So they could they could do some work that partnership as well, Misha. All right. Well, let's move into news around the league. There was the Carolina Conference. Uh, for singles, Jackson Gore took the win there. Doubles, Kevin Whitaker and Tommy Silker. Slicker, sorry. Southeast Conference, Kyle Malone took singles and doubles, Tubby and Tice Cobb. And of course, we got to mention Rosie freaking Streaker. Yes. <laughs> what, is going on? what is Rosie Streaker drinking? <laughs> she's yeah, crazy. Whatever, whatever that, whatever that regimen is by Rosie Streaker, I need to get on that. Um, yeah, exactly. I want to add something. I was at the Carolina conference all weekend. Yes. So I did all of the streaming. Jack Gore. Jack Gore played Jake Gore in the finals. Isn't that okay, crazy? Of this event. When you talk about open singles, you had Jamie Graham. Okay. You had Trevor Brooks. You had Kaylee Hunter, Tyler Poitras, all of these great pros. And all came down to. 13 year old Jack versus 13 year old Jake. And they were by far and away the best players that weekend. They both went undefeated. They never lost until they met in the finals. And then Jack slaughtered Jake. I mean, it wasn't even close in the finals. Jack Gore was about as good as I think I've ever seen him. If we get that version of Jack Gore, that version of Jack Gore, 
in the pro division this season is a top 10 player. Guarantee it. Um, wow. He was, he was that good. Had a nice little young gun come up through that. That is kind of on our radar next year. Colby Shearer really had a, had a nice run that kind of surprised a lot of people. I think he's, he plays a really dirty game. I mean, block every round type of dirty game. Um, I timed the rounds between um, Jake Gore and Colby Shearer. And one round of eight bags thrown took 23 seconds. It was, <laughs> it was absolutely, I could, I was making the joke that I couldn't even deliver commentary. It was, well, there, eight it, bags it, it, I said, I said, I said, Philip Lopez doesn't deliver one bag in 23 seconds by the, wow. uh, on some instances, 23 <laughs> seconds for eight bags. It was, it was rapid fire, but yeah, in the end, um, Kevin Whitaker is a PDC player that can make some noise. He's okay. got to, if he can get out of his own head in some instances and not overthink some shots, he's, he's actually a really talented player that could actually make some noise, making it in some brackets and beat some players. But Overall, it was cool to see the Gores really dominate. Well, Trey, I did make a video on how to get out of your head when you're playing cornhole. So thanks for that. <laughs> Shameless plug. Shameless, Shameless plug. plug. Yep. Go check it out. Cornhole Mish. All right. Let's get into the draft grades for the National West. Hey, so Mish, talk- real quick. Yeah, go ahead. If I could just say, because uh, when I saw when I saw that the Twins had made it in the final, I wasn't following it, but I just pulled it up real quick right before the show, and I thought there was a couple good – talking points to that if I can. So again, this Carolina conference is dumb, really. I mean, you're talking about, and I'm, I'm looking yeah. at this live here, so so bear with me. I, I don't have this uh, organized, but Frank Modlin's in the field. Uh, Jamie Graham, Trevor Brooks. Uh, let me switch over to this one here. You got Travis Purser, who's who's making a big Bobby Hunt, uh, Cameron Presley. So, I mean, this thing is pretty stacked. Allison Peters, but real quick, like right before the show, I was just trying to make sense of how people finished versus PPR. So I thought this was pretty interesting. Check this out. Um, Jamie Graham was third in PPR with a 993 over 58 rounds, and he finished ninth. I thought that was pretty interesting. There was one even more interesting. Let me see if I can find it. Um, one interesting tidbit about Jamie Graham, and I, I, I hate to even bring this up, but he left the building – was gone, came back, and he was 10 minutes late to his board. They almost forfeited him. Wow. He, play, he played a 12-year-old, and when he got to the board, the 12-year-old Zach Aiken, really talented kid, Jamie Graham threw all airmails in the game, threw a 5.8 PPR in one of the games and lost. What? So. I kind of want to throw the Jamie Graham segment out of that particular tournament. I don't, and I, I don't want to speculate on anything. I don't know if something personal was going on, but I almost want Moonshine. to moonshine outlier. <laughs> it, and no, because he turned around and then he took the next game. He, he'd started the next game the same way. And then he tried to turn it on halfway through after he gave up a nine spot to somebody and then he fought all the way back and then lost like 21-20. It was a weird day for Jamie Graham. I think something was going on behind the scenes that we didn't know about. So I'm kind of trying to throw that throw that little you know data point away. All right. Well, let me add these two real quick and then we can move on, Mish. Your number one and your number two leading PPRs in bracket B, Frank Modlin in Slicker. Modlin number one. He finished – Drum roll. We don't have one. 13th. 13th <laughs> wow. with the number one PPR. And Slicker, who was the number two, finished 25th. So those kind of stood out to me as wow. PPRs don't always win. Wow. All right. Are we ready, guys? Can we – we, anything else? We're Maybe ready. This is We're what ready. happens when we do uh, <laughs> run a show on the fly. We're going to talk about yeah. whatever. All right, well, you've got exactly <laughs> five minutes to give your draft grades, so let's get to it. Trey, we got the Las Vegas High We're Rollers, the Colorado Timber, the California Slingers, and the Arizona Bird. Our last, our last segment can go short, Michelle. Okay, our last segment can go short. Fine, fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what, what do we got? High rollers first. Um, yeah, let's go high rollers. So, uh, really, I like, um, you know, I think most of these are going to be boring grades again because 
wow, they're all really boring for this one. I promise when we do next week, when we do our central grades, they're a lot more up and down. Um, <laughs> at least so we, got High we, got rollers, we got Bs. High rollers, uh, I got a B. Um, <laughs> easy. I like e- easy and raw. Um, Alan Rawls, one, two is a good one, two punch. Um, I like Costanza and I like Tice Cobb where they are. There are some, there are some high upside players. Um, my kind of overall feel was that there was no great steals. I didn't feel like they, they got any, but they got somebody that, that jumped out of the, you know, jumped off the page, but I didn't feel like they reached for anybody or got any big misses that they could have had. Um, the one pick I like Carter Bennett being very at the very end of the draft could be someone that could perform like a mid round pick or even higher. I felt like that was the one steal of the draft. So overall, I, I give it a B. Okay. Anthony? Yeah, just big picture kind of looking at this National West as a whole. Um, just to get the PPR discussion out of the way. The Las Vegas high rollers kind of stood out from the rest of the pack. They're 11th overall out of all the teams with an average 908, while the other three teams clustered in this National West are a nine, like a mid 9 2 to a 9 3. So. Um, that might not sound like a lot, but when you have a 0.2 better PPR than the, the rest, I kind of look at it this, at this way. If you average 15 to 20 rounds a game and you have a 0.2 B DPR better than your opponent, I'm basically getting handicap of four points to start a match. So that might not seem significant, but you give me a handicap of four points. That's 20% of the points to 21. So that is really significant a 0.2 PPR difference. But yeah, speaking to the high rollers specifically, you got Tanner and Cody uh, Henderson as captains. Pretty legendary for captains. I love that. And then your third captain there, Hunter Thorne, is on track to break out this season. So pretty strong for the three, I think, starting it out. Zockline is a number one pick, a natural partner for Tanner Halbert, I think was a good call in round one. Alan Rawls in the second round there felt early to me because still in the field, you had a Vincent Frisch a Jeremy Frazier, a Nate Stevens, Jeff Reynolds. I mean, Gustafson, just to name a few. So Alan Rawls felt a little early. But you've got Tanner Halbert as a Florida captain, putting a lot of value in a fellow Florida player in Alan Rawls. So, And it could pay off. I mean, Alan Rawls could 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 turn out to be a great pick and was great in Stop. Myrtle Beach. What do you got, Trey? What do you think Alan Rawls was ranked last season? Gun to your head. you got to give me a guess. 59. 45. Okay. That's pretty good. Does that change your mind at all? Yeah, it does. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did the same thing in my head. Yeah. That's why I, that's why I ask you. Yeah, that's good. That's good to know. Um, but then it was interesting. They switched over to two carpet baggers. And I'm going to have a question for you here in a second, Trey. They go Costanza, then Tice Cobb with their three, four. And it, similarly, Tice felt a little early. So, Trey, if you're going to pull a carpet bagger for Kobe Costanza, let's start with uh, Eric Anderson. You got Eric Anderson in the field. Anderson or Tice Cobb? I'll take the upside of Tice Cobb. Mm-hmm. You have Bella in the field. Bella or Tice Cobb? Ooh, I take Bella. I take and then Bella. the last one that kind of shot off the page to me here, Brandon Jones, who was a top 20-something player last year. Jones or Tice Cobb, if you're trying to grab a carpet bagger for Costanza. Oh, so <laughs> much volatility in Jones. I don't yep. know what I'm going to – but I, I can say the same thing about Tice as well. So I'm kind of – I get it. Um, I'm, I might take Jones. I like your point. Okay. So, yeah, I was just kind of trying to make a point there that maybe Tice was a little early, but maybe he doesn't. I mean, it could be uh, – could be just depending on how you're looking at it. Um, Jay Dot in the fifth round, I thought was a good pick, and there's a good reason why. Cody isn't an easy partner to play with, and Cody's going to expect his expectations of his partner is going to be high, and he's not afraid to vocalize that. So not you can't just stick anyone with 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 uh, Cody Henderson and expect them to be successful. I think that Jay Dot was picked in the fifth round specifically to partner up with Cody. Uh, we'll see if they actually do that when we get into it. Hector in the sixth round might be the biggest value pick of the entire draft. Uh, we'll have to see how he uh, does this season, but I think he might be the biggest value pack of the whole draft. 
Uh, overall, I think they're five through 10. They go Dotson, Hector, Seals, Singleton, Fillingham, Lippard. I think that was all pretty good. 11 through 13, eh, I'm not feeling that so well. But overall, I'm thinking of B to a B minus Misha. All right. Colorado Timber. Uh, I gave him a B plus. I like this one a little bit better. Um, Frank Maudlin and Vincent Frisch, a one-two punch, I thought was a good, solid start. Frank Maudlin always delivers in these round limit formats time and time again. He shows that he can compete at the highest level there. Vincent Frisch is a high upside player, gives you a lot of potential. There's some downside there, but overall, I really like what I see out of Frisch. Um, I think there's a lot riding on Austin Slobom, Eric Anderson, and Tyler Parent having bounce back years. If you take this a year and a half ago, this seems like a slam dunk A to A plus draft. Fast forward 18 months. There's a lot riding on slow bomb Anderson in parent. You have to have better production compared to last year coming up this, this year. I think Sisson was too early. I know I've heard a lot of good things about Byron Sisson, but I just felt yeah. like he was too early of a pick. You could have got him later. Whether or not his talent is there is one thing. I'm saying he's available in the next round, in my opinion. So just something I thought was a little bit high. Um, I like the value late. Overall, I give a B plus. Anthony, agree? Disagree? Oh, I'm pretty close. Um, just kind of big picture, uh, regional bias, bag branding. And it really reflects the captains. The captains are all over the board, right? Three different brands, three different regions. It shows in their team. Eight different states, 10 different bag brands. So really, really broad in that spectrum. I agree with you on the one-two punch. Um, I don't hate Frisch in the second round. Some people might be like, who's Frisch? If you look nationally, we know who Frisch is. Uh, coming out of the PDC, I think that that's going to be a good pickup for them. Slow bomb, too early in the third round, in my opinion. I, I, I was kind of looking at it. I'm like, was that Maudlin pulling for that early pick? Is that Hodlin, uh, Holland pulling from like a regional bias? Or is that Hisner saying, go grab my fellow Titan bag brother? Um, so there's three different things that could have pulled slow bomb in there in the third round. I thought he was a little bit early. Uh, you mentioned Anderson in Sisson and the breakout. I think Anderson does have that breakout season. I think he is going to break out this season. So I think that he was a good pickup uh, where he was at late. Matt Allen, second to last pick, could be a really, really good pickup for them. Uh, and they might end up using him quite a bit more. You know, you think my last pick and my second to last pick, I might not use them that much in my teams. I think they end up using Matt Allen quite a bit. B plus uh, for that one, Mish. Same. All right. How about the Cali Slingers? Be a gentle. Boring old, a boring old B for the Cali Slingers there. <laughs> Michelle hates my very vanilla grading system, but it's it's tough. I mean, it's tough. It's different when you have an NFL draft. It's like so many concentrated picks. It's like you yeah. can say this was a terrible three picks out of seven. That's a bad draft. Here, it's just so many. Um, yeah. I love the first pick, um, you know, great first pick, but uh, with Alec Ryan, a slam dunk. Anthony had him number one overall as a prediction. So to get number one overall anywhere but number one is a great idea, right? Yeah. Travis Purser, I, I don't know how much I'm ready to say it's a reach. I mean, I like what yeah. I'm seeing out of him, but I just think he's available later. Like one more round, um, I think it's a smidge of a, a smidge of a reach. Um Look, you got McClem and Peters way late in the draft. What in the world is Dalton McClem doing on that draft board that late, right? It doesn't make any sense. Even, I mean, look at Peters too. Th those names shouldn't have been available. So I got a lot of great value out of those two later in the draft. Um, but just a bunch of different question marks, like, um, you know, and how certain players would perform doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be bad or doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be good. It just, I just don't know. And so because of that, I kind of have to wait in the middle. I'm going to give an overall B. Anthony. Yeah. You mentioned Ryan and he was coming in as the hot player for the draft. Uh, does he stay that way though? Does he stay that hot? I think is going to be the question. I think he does. I mean, I've been talking to him quite a bit. He's pretty focused on his craft. I mean, he's really into working his craft, and it's a very unique style that he plays. Um, motivation is there daily to, to become better. So I think he does stay hot, and I think he's worth the first-round pick. You mentioned for, uh, Purser in the second round. 
that could be a brilliant pick by the end of the season. But I agree. I think that he's maybe available there in the second round. Could they have waited on him? But I think that he's second round worthy from what we're seeing him. But he's kind of right on the cusp there. Sasueta in the third round, I think he's available in the fourth round. Um, just kind of moving here. Bracey Blanton, what, what do you guys have on this guy? I know he's a high PPR guy, came through the qualifier and the gauntlet, but do you know anything about this kid? Just that Wally loves him. Yeah, Wally loves him. Kay, That's Kay all Kay I know. Loves Bracey Blanton. So I don't have a ton, too. I know he's solid. I've seen him play a little bit. Solid player. Um, don't Again, that goes back to my question, though, right? My questions, that's a big question mark for me. I don't know if that's a really good pick or not a good pick. Right. Allison Peters was third to last pick. I think that she was a really good good pick. There was only one other player with a higher PPR from her pick to the end of the draft. So over 40 picks, she was certainly the, the she was the second highest PPR, so certainly a good pickup for them. And to note, there's four players on this team that made it in via the pro qualifier. That's about double what we would expect with 16 teams. So th th you're going to get grit. I think you'll get a grit from these type of players that have made it through that qualifier. So I was like a B to B plus Mish on the, on the slingers. All right. Last one, Arizona burn. What do you got, Trey? A boring old B boring old <laughs> B again. Michelle hates me so boo. much. B for boo. Um, <laughs> one, two punch of Holland and Reynolds is a great start. Yes. Derek Holland from what I saw this weekend, um, he was unbelievable in doubles. I'll put it this way. They lost in the finals. They got double dipped. Um, Josh Holland was not good. He kicked to Zuka. That's how frustrated he was. And you don't see Josh Holland get frustrated outwardly. Um, but Derek Holland was locked in. Um, they, in a way, I think they should have won doubles. They were up 18 to four in the finals of game one and gave up 18 straight points and then lost 21 to five in the second game. So it just fell off. But Derek Collin, super consistent. Jeff Reynolds is one of those sleeper picks. He's going to be great. Uh, I love that one two punch. The burn got their guy in Moses Sesueda. They got their guy, but Sesueda has to stay hot. He was hot last year. He's got to stay hot in the round limited format. So he's just one of those guys that did he did he peak and he's got to come back down, or is he someone that's now emerged as an elite level player? Um, so I like these early picks. Um, I thought they could be really good steals, but I don't love the late round picks. And so because of that, I, I drop off a little bit of the the grade there at the end. Um, love the first half of the draft, not so much the second half. I give him a B. All right, Anthony. Yeah, captains. So Zaft, Hadley, Lopez, all Arizona, all ultra. I agree with you on the one, two to mention with uh, Derek Holland. He was the number one. The, he was the only player in the draft that averaged above a 10 on the season going into the draft, which is absolutely ridiculous. So Trey, that's going to come to my big question for you. And I asked that one two to three episodes ago, two to three weeks ago, who's the better Holland right now? Derek. Derek Holland, that's kind of what I'm thinking too. Um, middle part of the draft uh, was pretty good uh, for the Arizona Burn. Like you said, they got Sasueta, they got Schroeder, and they got Jones. Jones, a really nice pickup in the fifth round. Uh, he was a top 50 guy last season. So you, if he was ranked 50 and you look at the draft, he essentially went 118th because he was the 70th pick plus 48 captain. So I think that was a big value for them. I think Reynolds before Sasueta was a good move. I think that's where you sit on him. They wanted him, but they didn't yeah. go and grab him at two, right? They could have grabbed Sasueta in the second round. They waited, grabbed a Reynolds, and then they waited for that to come all the way around and got him in the third round. I think a lot of captains could have got kind of too antsy and grabbed him in the second round. So good move for them right there. Um <clears throat> This team's pretty ultra heavy. Six ultra players, uh, just to mention that. Um, Sasueta and, and Mendoza um, are the only Arizona players uh, in the region outside of the captain. So starting with three Arizona hard players, they only picked up two Arizona players out of the 13 picks. But overall, B-plus for me and Mish on Arizona Burn. All right. Ready for some buy or sell? Yep, let's do it. Ready for some rapid fire buy or sell? <laughs> so let's that's go. how that's going to go. All right. I'd take Kyle Malone and Devin Harbaugh over Jamie Graham and Mark Richards. Buy or sell? Wait. Yeah. 
right now or like at the end of the season? Right now. Right now. Okay. You put them in a put them in a match right now. Who do you today? Take? Yeah, gotcha. it's happening today. Uh, this is kind of like a 2023 versus 2022 feel. I like. I'll buy it. I'll take Malone, and I'll take Devin Harbaugh right now. Right now, right this minute, over Jamie Graham and Mark Richards. I'll buy it. Anthony, if you don't take Malone and Harbaugh right now, you, you're not watching Cornhole right now. No, exactly. The, they're both putting up insane. I mean, Harbaugh this weekend was like, what was it, like a 10-8 or something on an 11s, entire tournament? 11s, 11s. I mean, so in, many. Yeah. Yeah, you got to take that one. I'll take that one as well, Mish, all day, right now. All right, how about I'd take Rosie Streaker over Kaylee Hunter? <laughs> I'm going to take that one, too. I'm going to buy, buy that it. one, too. Buy I it. mean, Rosie, uh, Kaylee's been fine, um, but Rosie has been on another level. Yeah, Kaylee's been great. Kaylee's been great, but you said it. Rosie's just on another level. It's, on it's, another level. Yeah, that one's pretty, pretty clear, too. All right. Fisher Hamilton and Ryan Wiedenfeld over Josh Holland and Tanner Halpert. Uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to actually, I'm going to sell it. Like, really? what? I know, I know, I know, I get it. And, and maybe like today, and I know it's right now, but I, I don't know. Something tells me you put him in a, in a, in a vacuum Josh Holland and Tanner Halbert are still these elite level players that are going to find a way to make anything happen that they need to. Ryan Wiedenfeld and Fisher Hamilton, this up and coming. I, I'm going to sell it, even though everything in my body is telling me to buy it, I, I, but I'm going to sell it. Anthony? I'm buying all day. Hamilton Bye. just continues to win opens. Wiedenfeld's going to be on TV in a couple weeks. Maybe give me Derek Holland and Tanner Halbert, but then again, Tanner's not playing up to what he can either. He's not really doing much, but I see Tanner coming out to the first national and in the championship match. That's just how yeah. he is. But right now he's, there's yeah. nothing special. Travis Purser and Gavin Cano over Philip Lopez and Joe Neistead. Ooh. <laughs> no selling it. I'll take yes. Neistead and no. uh, yeah, I'll, I'm going to sell that one. So, all right. Lexi Hugeback and Emily Downer over Connie Altice and Cameron Belvin. We haven't got to see much of them though yet. I yeah, what do we kind of yeah, you're kind of rolling off like a dirty style game. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Altice and Belvin. I think he, he, even across the season, I think Altice and Belvin are gonna outperform them just a hair. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Downer and Hugeback, they play a different game than everybody else, and I think that can cause problems for people. True. Anthony? Yeah, it could, but what do we got from Hugeback and Downer? Yeah. I mean, maybe they're playing locally, but we don't see them. Belvin, she's playing all over the place in everything. El is still killing it, so, yeah, I'm going to sell as well. All right. Trey, it's your, it's your time. Name that team. Yeah, well, uh, we, we made up some good time there, Michelle. We made up some yes. good time on that. Yes, that's uh, why I said that. rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one is um, – this is this is an interesting one, okay? So, again, name that team. We got an idea here. You're trying to guess who, who this team is. And most of it – you may guess it early, you may not, but I just think it's you know good to review some of these teams. This team, 12 of the 16 players on the roster have played on a broadcast. 12 of the 16, okay? okay. The team, okay, The if you add the team manager, it's 17. What? <laughs> Wait, what? Team manager, oh, okay. Okay. This team has one... Two, three, four seniors on the team. Oh my goodness. Okay. Team has that many uh, seniors. If you add all of the ACL titles for everybody on the team, this team is top three in total ACL titles. 
All right, I got a guess just because there was one clue that kind of gave it away, I think. Is it too soon? Kentucky no, Colonels. Yes. The Kentucky Colonels. Yeah. What okay. gave it away? Who's the, who's the uh, manager? Lunsford. Josh uh, Lunsford. I was trying to remember all the man. I can't remember all the manager names. That's crazy. McGuffin yeah. dropping all those. Uh, that was when he went all airmail with the slide rights, right? Yes, it is. Yes. That's exactly what it yes. is. Um, so players, oh Matt God. Guy, Damon Dennis, Jim Glasscock, Brett Guy, Tom Gustafson, Bob Vaunch, Dave Sutton, Sam Finley, Nate Voyer, Kimberly Glass, and Scott Schultz and Whitney Martinez, all with that level of experience. I mean, that's a lot. That's a big number. Um, and the next stat I was going to give, this team has zero rookies. Yep. Zero rookies on the Kentucky yep. Colonels. Um, you know, and you talk about ACL titles, add them all together. Anytime you have a team that has Matt Guy, Brett Guy, Damon Dennis, mm -hmm. and then throw in guys like Bob Vaunch, even a Sam Finley who's got some titles, they have a track record of winning at the highest level and winning on a consistent basis. So, um, the Kentucky Colonels, we're going to review it next week, but they actually get my my highest draft grade out of any other team. And we'll, and like I said, we'll talk about it next week, but I just really like what they put together. They put together a great mix of veterans, and I think they're trying to show that you don't have to have these rookie young guns, these carpet bag throwers to be successful uh, per se, but overall I really like the team. Did you hear yeah, Damon's I trade request on our bag and a bragan? Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. What did he say? Oh, he used our show to ask if he could he get Jim McGuffin. <laughs> <laughs> like he put it out there. I think Mies was like, uh, all right, I'll broker that for you. Let me make yeah, I'm like, I, can, I can make that happen. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. We got hot takes and we're concerned you might have the same one. So let's hear it. Trey, you go yeah, first. Yeah, no, I want to hear Anthony's yeah, first. Before, okay. Right, okay, Anthony's yeah. going first. Before the show, we were kind of just you know, bullshitting a little bit. We kind of felt like we might have had the same hot take, but we weren't either. Neither one of us was willing to give a little bit. So, um, yes, my hot take is going to be the open in doubles. Burton Jr. and Sammy Soda win open number seven. We had the same hot take. <laughs> <laughs> we knew it was going to happen. Dang it. That means that do I have to, choose, do I have to change my yeah, mind you, now? Hold on. Yeah, so mine's going to be Caden Allen and Philip Lopez. So what's your doubles team, Trey? If you have to pick a different one since we... Oh, gosh. I have to pick a different <laughs> hot take now. Um, all right, no, fine. Pick a doubles fine. team. Pick I'll a do, you know team. what? I'm going to go... He's going to go Sammy and singles. Go, I'll go Sammy and singles. <laughs> oh, no, I knew it. So I knew exciting. it. <laughs> fine. Okay, you want to... Where's my Prove It shirt, right? All this talk out of Texas... All this, you know, greatest thing ever, right? Sammy yeah, Soto. Yeah. Fine. You know what? I'll take him. I'll I'm Prove taking it. Sammy Prove Soto it. in singles. Prove it. Prove it. Right? <laughs> That's all I gotta say. I'm done. No pressure. Drop that, mic drop <laughs> on that note. <laughs> all right. That's all we got time for. Enjoy all the cornhole this weekend in New Mexico, and we'll see you next time.